Welcome to Innovation Talks. Join us weekly as we discuss with distinguished industry guests how to refine and improve corporate innovation and new product development. Hosted by Paul Heller, Sophion Chief Evangelist. Do you want to revolutionize your approach to innovation? Dive into our free ebook designed for product managers and innovators. Discover how embracing an innovation ops strategy can turn chaos into control. You can download your copy now at sophion.com slash innovation ops dash ebook. That's sophion.com forward slash innovation ops hyphen ebook. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Hope you're having a great summer or winter if you're on the other side of the equator from where I am right now, but sure glad you could join us again. My guest today has been on the show before, Alex Slawsby. He's the Chief Growth Officer at InnoLead, otherwise known as Innovation Leader. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we had a great episode last year, I guess it was already, late last year. We talked about the role of innovation in a company and, and some of Alex's experiences in innovation and the innovator's dilemma and how innovation teams and innovation leaders can be successful, how they're perceived in their companies. Just great episodes. So if you've not listened to that, I, I highly encourage you to go listen to it. We'll put a link in the show notes. But Alex, welcome back to the show. Paul, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. How are things? Think, things are well, thank you. Uh, yeah. Summer's drawing to a close, back to school season, and at InnoLead, just doing a lot of preparation for our big impact conference, which will take place in Boston at the end of October. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about that. I mean, InnoLead is a great resource. You know, for the people listening, if you've never checked it out, you should. It's a, there's a whole community in there, and, and they do a lot, lots of good information, good events. It's just really a good source for innovation, people working in innovation. But tell us about this conference. Yeah, Paul, thanks so much. So uh, every year we run a large conference in the Boston area called Impact. It's taking place this year from October 23rd to October 25th. We'll have about two and a half days of main stage sessions, workshops, demo tables, a lot of networking time. And it's designed specifically for corporate leaders who are in innovation functions, R&D functions, digital strategy, corporate development, anything where they need to change a large organization and help a large organization do something differently. We'll have sessions on AI and generative AI, how to collaborate effectively internally, how to accelerate growth, digital transformation, startups, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and we've got a great lineup of speakers who will be there, leaders from AARP and CarMax, Comcast, Fidelity, Hasbro, Lowe's, the NFL, Target, United Airlines, and a bunch of other ones. And again, only corporate leaders can attend, so it's a great community audience. You can certainly see more information about it and get tickets on InnoLead.com. Great. And we'll put some links to that in the show notes as well, but highly encourage people to check that out. Yeah. So when we were talking, Alex, recently, we were talking about some of your experiences. We often talk about why innovation succeeds, why it fails, where its challenges are. It's just a common topic that we have going on. And uh, you were sharing some great experiences from your, your early days of innovation, kind of your first, I guess, your first job out of university. So let's start there. Yeah, so happy to share. Look, for me, it's been about a 20-year corporate innovation journey. And it started just out of college when I went to work for IDC, which is a technology industry analyst firm, market research company, just based outside of Boston. Gartner and Forrester are two of its peers. And I was fortunate to join the mobile devices group. And back then, the group was focused on the markets for PDAs and Palm Pilots, uh, and also mobile phones, Although in the U.S., mobile phones were seen as sort of basic dumb things. You could, you know, sp speak on them, maybe do some text messaging, but that wasn't really big in the U.S. Mobile phones were certainly much bigger and smarter. The market was much bigger. The devices were much smarter outside the U.S. in Europe and Asia. Uh, our team partnered with our teams around the world, but we were really focused on the U.S. market. And everybody was really excited about PDAs and Palm Pilots. Those were the cool thing with yeah. rudimentary apps and interactivity Mobile phones weren't that great, although by the time I wrapped up, which is about four and a half years after I started, everything was coming together. Mobile phones were getting smart, and that posed a lot of challenges for the corporations in the industry. Tremendous amount of innovation in those early 2000 years. I mean, all sorts of players dipping their toes in, you know, 
some some still around, some not. Some got into the business, some didn't. Just just a wild time. And when we talk about innovation. That's a that's a neat area of innovation to just focus on a bit and maybe what these companies were trying to achieve and what they they didn't achieve and maybe why they didn't achieve it. So I know you've got you've got many to choose from, but let's just, you know, maybe step through a few of them today about just I think it'd be fun just to talk about them. So maybe pick one. Start there. Yeah. Yeah, happy to do it, Paul. So one of the coolest things about the job for somebody into technology like myself was that the companies that produce mobile devices, it was very important to them that us analysts were smart about what they were doing and the devices they were creating. And so they gave us devices. And so I've got a box of probably 40 or 50 (laughs) cell phones and PDAs and smartphones that I keep from those days. And it's a lot of fun to look back and see, you know, what devices had cutting edge technology back then. And of course, they were very rudimentary altogether compared to what we have now. But what was really interesting was that these mobile device companies, most of whom are not around anymore, and if they are around, they're uh, sort of very different than they were back then. Let me name Mm. some. So we had, you know, Palm, we had Handspring, we had HP, Compaq and Casio, we had Nokia, Motorola, Ericsson, again, to name a few, Mm. Research in Motion, BlackBerry. Again, some of them are still around, most are not, and if they are still around, again, they're very different. But back then, convergence was the key word mobile phones, talking on the phone was very important to everybody. That was how you communicated, but also data and other things, right? So like research in motion, right? Famous for creating BlackBerry devices and pagers. And this is an example of a device they had back then. They actually had a model called the 957 looked exactly like this, but there was pressure from corporate users who didn't want to carry a cell phone too. So there was pressure on research in motion to put voice capability into this Mm. device. Okay. Then you had Nokia. Well, Nokia had mobile phones, but there were gamers. There were people who loved playing games on phones. So Nokia said, well, let's create a gaming phone. And they made this thing called the N-Gage with a slot you could put in a card with games. And again, it looks like a game controller, right? Nokia was also really interested in creating fashion devices. So they created the Mm. 7280, kind of like a, a lipstick phone with a little mirror that pops out. You can actually access the camera by sliding it apart. There was a mirror there, perhaps for women to look at their lipstick uh, and their makeup, things like that. So they said, hey, this is gonna be really cool. Yeah. And then the final one I'll show today, we had uh, Hewlett Packard who came out with the iPack. It was a Windows mobile device. Again, that was a PDA and with voice. So in, in all of these cases of the devices, you had a company saying, we produce certain mobile devices today. We know they need to evolve to meet customer or consumer needs. We're going to add functionality to what we've already created because that's what we believe the customer wants. Mm. The challenge is, of course, that these devices in- introduced all kinds of compromises in order to be successful. I'll mention two, and-, and then we can go from there. Research in Motion, they knew corporate users wanted to have uh, telephony. They wanted voice as well. They didn't want to carry two devices. Research in Motion added it to this device. It became the 5810. This is a 2002 device. But if you had to make a call, or pick up the phone, you couldn't actually just pick up the device and hold it to your ear. You actually had to use a wired earbud. You had to wow. plug in here, I guess, keep it in your ear. There was no Bluetooth, yeah. which made it you know, suboptimal. And then I'll bring back this Nokia product. Again, this was designed to be a fashion device. So again, people could show it off and it could be out, You know, when you're out on the town, you could have this really cool device. But there were compromises required. In fact, there's a little spinner here. Basically, they called it the Nava spinner. And anytime you wanted to, you know, select a character to do text messaging, Mm. you had to spin it to go between the characters and then tap into it. And again, it made it extremely hard to text message or choose anything. So it was a trade-off. They said, oh, people will love it. And in the case of this and that BlackBerry and some of these other devices, they just weren't hits because of the compromises introduced. So, so I mean, how did they end up there? How did they, how did they... You know, think of, well, this will be okay. Let's put it out there. What, what was the mindset? What was, I mean, there's so much disruption going on. They're probably afraid of each other, trying to move as fast as they can, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, this is the, the, the challenge, the complexity associated with, with innovating in big companies that I absolutely love because it's so complicated. It's so hard to overcome But again, if we can somehow figure out solutions, this is how big companies can can innovate over time and transform and stay relevant. 
Look, the challenge is if you're a big company and you're even remotely successful in an industry, you developed capabilities, the ability to make a product or a service yeah. that's made you successful, right? You're successful. Yeah, yeah. And if you look to expand into new markets, if you, you know, much less see opportunities where the customer wants something different, you have every incentive to say, given who we are, given what we make, how do we make it better? Or how do we adjust it to meet customer needs? You have no incentive to almost act like a startup and say, well, let's really start with the customer needs, the jobs to be done and start from scratch. No, you've got, you know, maybe thousands or tens of thousands of employees and, you know, all kinds of, you know, the supply chain and the manufacturing lines and all of that. Yeah. And so you say, great, you know, we're going to build the thing that we believe people want. A great example, here's that Nokia N-Gage again. It looks just like a gaming controller to try to create a great gaming experience. But the problem is they had to suboptimize the phone experience. You actually have to hold it up to your head like this because the mic is down here, right, to talk on it. And it created all, there were all kinds of you know, memes sort of back then, but people shot yeah. funny videos early on of people ho holding toasters and various things up to their head yeah. because, again, it was really awkward. So it worked as a game controller, but not as a phone. So I think this is the, the biggest challenge around corporate innovation. If you're tracking closely what the customer really wants, you then have every incentive, though, to rationalize what you're hearing from the customer to fit your existing capabilities in your organization. Mm -hmm. And then you produce things that actually very few people, if any, want. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember a podcast episode I did with Bill Bean. He was talking about Parker Hannafin and their change from, uh, and we saw many companies do this, this change from technology-driven innovation. So we're going to make something. And then we're going to go out and sell it to well, let's understand if somebody wants something and then we'll figure out how to make it. So a lot of change, innovation changed a lot in the last 20 years, shifting from, you know, this push model to this pull model of, of, of type of innovation. And a lot of these devices were the same way. You know, you, I'm thinking of brands, brands back then that were, well, there were brands that were known, but maybe not known at the consumer level, like Motorola, right? Motorola owned radio communication devices and, and you know, every every uh, town, police station, police, fo uh, Motorola had it, right? But but I don't think as a, as a, as a consumer, I heard Motorola, but I remember they had the Razor phone, which was hugely popular, not a PDA. It was going against everything, you know, all these other ones tried to buck that, you know, buck that trend and go a little bit different way, but they were out there. But then, you know, Palm... Handspring. I mean, all these companies you never heard of that came out of nowhere all of a sudden to, to, to be in it and then wildly successful and then gone. Yeah. And actually, I have some Motorola razors and I have an Apple Newton from the early 90s. People yeah. may not know or remember that Apple came out with one of the original PDAs back then. I mean, look, you know, here, here's the, the challenge, right? So as we've, Paul, we've talked about, right? You know, people don't buy products or services, right? They buy outcomes, jobs to be yes. done, right? They want to yeah. look a certain way or feel a certain way or accomplish a certain task. And that's where they're seeking, right? So of course, the goal of any organization should be selling the outcome, right? You know, so it's yeah. like, you know, if, if the thing I want to do is stay connected to my family, I want to buy something that enables me to do that, right? I don't want to buy a phone. I want to buy something that, that helps me stay connected. Yeah. Other people want to be entertained or, you know, pass downtime, things like that. The, the, the big switch, so the, and the Motorola Razor was really successful because it was so thin. It was sort of very cool from a visual standpoint. It was right. a flip phone. The software experience was, was really, the user Art. interface, really rudimentary, right? Yeah, that was not Motorola's strength. And a side note, Motorola invested tons of money to make its own software platform, and it, and it never worked. Nokia mm. you know, had a Symbian platform. Nokia was never a, a, you know, a software company, but they put a lot of effort in. And basically what happened was, and, and you know, obviously I've got my, my iPhone here, when you are more focused on showcasing apps, and you've got the capability to offer experiences that people can adapt to themselves, right? I can pick and choose what apps, I can yeah. personalize it however I want. What, what really matters is the experience. Yes, the phone has to work really well, it has to yep. look good enough, but you see people then customizing everything inside of it, leveraging the software and service components. And this is what Apple saw and the other mobile device companies sort of tried to compete with, but could absolutely not do it like Apple did with, with iTunes. So this was, this was the thing. My device and my device experience can be personalized to me. Paul, yours can be personalized to you. 
yours, you know, you you may want to play games. Paul, I know you love games. You may want to play games. I may want to focus more on, you know, social connection. We can make the same device do those different things. You can't do that if it's a very hardware-centric experience. Apple started with the ground up thinking about the ecosystem, thinking about software. These mobile device companies were great at hardware and had no capabilities to really build a compelling software experience. That was part of the downfall. Yeah, I think it's kind of interesting because you know I, those companies. You know, we always talk about startups and, and, and disruptive innovation, right? And those companies invented a lot of this, and then they were they were disrupted and put out of business by a company that's been around a long time, right? Apple probably didn't know anything about about phones, but they got into the music, they got into the iPods. I mean, they just they just wiped the map, didn't they? So it's funny that a big company like that could wipe out all the startups, which, you know, you don't hear that. Everybody talks about what startups are going to disrupt the big companies. So that's a nice reverse example. Yeah. And look, you know, in in the end, everyone, all corporate leaders would agree with the fact that their organizations and their solutions need to be customer centric, right? We need to be focused on the customer. We need to create the solutions that will delight the customer. So that all that sounds great. Right. But that does not mean we are therefore going to build the solutions we can build to delight the customer, yeah. right? That's the difference. When you're a startup, you only become successful if you delight the customer with a business model that enables you to be successful. Yeah. But then the more successful you become, you build all these great capabilities to scale. Those become rigidities. We talked a lot about antibodies and it makes yeah. sense, right? If you're doing really well, you don't want to get distracted. You don't want yeah. people to suddenly shake it up like an Etch-a-Sketch and start again. But at that point, you're now servicing yourself. You're becoming in service of the product that you create. You're no longer staying fixed on the customer. This is like the biggest issue, right? Because to be truly customer centric, you need to somehow think, well, you know, maybe this product line, maybe all our capabilities today, they're not the right ones. We need to start from scratch. And of course, you know, that calls into question whether large companies should survive. It is much easier to do in this world of software and services where yeah. you can create apps and experiences. There's sort of your, you know, Meta, for example, and your Alphabet, obviously the app stores. They can all evolve with evolving consumer preferences. Yeah. It's much harder to do if you make physical things and you've got to change those things dramatically. I think we're seeing disruption change over time from, yeah. you know, the hardware world to what's possible in more of the, the digital software and services world. Yeah, it is. I mean, I'm thinking of televisions as an example right now. And the they were, you know, pretty static devices for many years. And then a lot of television manufacturers tried to make, you know, the app experience. And they had all different levels of success with that. But But I know, at least in America right now, they are definitely causing some issues where things have to be connected. They have to be connected to the Internet. If it's not... The device, the t- television is not usable, and they're at risk, in my opinion, of pushing that envelope a bit too far, where consumers mm-hmm. are going to say, "No, I don't want it." Now you hear, I can't think of a specific television example, but I read recently, maybe it was a, a, a it was another device that all of a sudden now, if I have it and I sell it to you, it's useless to you because mm-hmm. it was locked to me in my account mm-hmm. and, and whatnot, and. That actually, this device had no capability for somebody else to re-register it, and so this, mm-hmm. all these things are going to bite, you know, bite these companies that are trying this innovation. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a risky, a rough road, huh? Yeah, and look, I mean, you're seeing the conflict there between what a company wants to prioritize to generate the most profit possible, which can involve, you know, selling services and getting data from the the consumer. And all of that may create rigidities in terms of the experience. Like, hey, we want the data, we want these, you know, connectivity pieces with the consumer. So therefore, the device can only function if the service is in place. And that's exactly not what the consumer wants. So it's that tension between how we make money, but also how we serve the customer. Look, I mean, this is the the biggest issue. And in some cases, it's just you know, it's unavoidable. The aspiration is to do sort of this transformation where you realize that what the customer wants is totally different than what you make today. You create a separate group or you acquire something. And over time, you build that up, which is the solution that the customer really wants. And over time, you start staffing down and getting rid of what you do today. And that transformation is incredibly, incredibly hard. But arguably, that's sort of the only way you could make it work if you are so open-minded 
if you ask the, the, the most important questions, basic questions, which is, gosh, they want, what do they want? And gosh, we're open to the fact that they want something completely different than we can create. Are you going to engage that transformation? Most organizations and leaders don't even get there. They're not even willing to ask that basic question going, hey, maybe we're not the right company anymore. So they yeah. focus, as we've discussed, on optimizing for what they do today. And in the short term, in some cases, in the long term, in some cases, yeah. it drives the organization you know, down sometimes with really destructive consequences. Yeah. So I know at, at, at Interlead, you, you, you folks do, you're not really a consulting firm per se, but you're, you, know, you, do, you run workshops, you're involved with, with enabling the innovator, innovation community to address these kind of issues. What are some of the resources that you're seeing out there that, that, you know, that are available for people to, to talk about these kind of things and to, to, to try to you know, be, be aware of what's going to hit you or things like that, transformational type of things. Yeah, Paul, thanks for mentioning it. So yeah, no, we're not a consultancy. We're a membership organization. So corporate leaders subscribe to the content we create, the events we put on, on an annual basis. And then again, we've got, you know, folks like you and Sofian and Wellspring and other solution providers out there who sponsor what we do. We're really appreciative of that. And so our goal is to bring together these conversations and these insights and uncover them and make people aware of what happens and then give them some things to think about in terms of questions they should ask, recommendations, steps they should take. Ultimately, when it comes to this challenge we're talking about, it's an incredibly hard challenge to overcome. It's an incredibly hard problem to solve because it pits what's best for the company now versus what the customer really wants. Right. And so the best we can do there is encourage innovation leaders to become aware of this and then have transparent conversations, which are very hard to do in big companies, but around the reality and ask those tough questions. You know, if we were starting today, what would we build to absolutely delight the customer? And how does that look like or not look like who we are today? Yeah. And if there's a big difference between the ideal organization to satisfy the customer and the ideal solution and what we do today, you got to have some tough conversations. And maybe you say, great, let's go acquire, let's set up a separate group and let's work through that transformation so we become what we need to become or begin to have those internal conversations and contemplations about, well, you know something, maybe we can't go there. And so we need to you know, redefine our market or focus on you know, segments where what we do today is good enough. Those conversations don't happen often enough. We try to educate the community about this, to look for this, to, to see it, it may be happening in their market, in their organization, and talk about what the organization is going to do and may not be willing to do. Yeah, you know what? I think that's a necessary step that doesn't happen enough is the, okay, I think everybody jumps to, okay, this is what we should do. But to your point of, well, how does that look like or not look like who we are today. That's a tougher, tougher conversation to have. And, you know, well, I mean, we know how hard it is in large companies for, for, a, you know, if you're a leader in a large company to, you don't want to say you don't know, or yeah. I don't know, or I don't have the answer, or maybe I'm not the right person to lead this new, you know, digitally DNA to organization when we've been analog. There's no incentive to do it. Yeah. And there's pretty much no incentive to say, you know something, I think we're headed in the wrong direction, right? No, right? right? These are the people who end up, you know, their, their careers get sidetracked because Correct. of it. Yeah. Well, again, the incentives that, that, you know, set you up for success as an individual and in organization are frequently misaligned with the right things you might say or speak or do yeah. to support change. Again, this is that intractable problem that's, you know, it's, it's, it's so great to try to figure it out but it's so difficult to solve. And, you know, at least for the time being, it's going to be a, a big challenge that leaders will continue to wrestle with. Yeah, for sure. But, I, you know, I think there's also things if you're, a, you know, an innovation worker, we'll use that term, or a person really, you know, you're, you're not the CEO, you're not the divisional vice president, but you, you are definitely responsible for new products, bringing products out, you know, those kind of things. I think there are basic things that you can make sure you do from a best practice standpoint. And we've been talking about some of those things, you know, yeah, step back and do a map and say, okay, how does this compare to who we are and what we are? And you could present that back in a way that the executive team can consume it. That doesn't make you look bad. Right. And I think skipping that step 
is, is not a good thing to do. But doing that step, knowing that's something I should do as, a, as an innovation professional in the company, is, it would be, you know, it's a good thing. Yeah, look, without a doubt, I'll quickly bring back the Nokia device. So, you know, I, ideally, and if you are in an innovation leadership role, Paul, as you suggested, there's few things more valuable than, you know, the voice of the customer, direct customer feedback. I mean, honestly, you know, though it's easy for consumers and, and you know, if it's a B2B situation, customers and focus groups to say they want something and then they'll never buy it or sign off on it. So you got to try to get closer to actual purchase intent. Like, will you put money down, right? That's yeah, something yeah. that's, you know, crowdfunding can certainly support that. But again, you look at this device and again, it became much maligned due to this sort of navvy spinner and, and the setup. So it's a good question to ask, Paul, maybe it's a future conversation to have. You sort of go back to Nokia back then and you say, you know, did they faithfully take this thing or early versions out to a wide range of consumers? And did the consumers they interviewed, the consumers with whom they researched, did they say, this is great, I want it. Now, did they say they want it in the focus group and then they had no intention of doing it because they didn't want to make the focus group moderator, right? Yeah, f feel badly. Did they focus on a segment that ultimately would adopt it, but was not remotely representative of a much bigger segment? Would be. Yeah. Or ultimately, was there an incentive to cherry pick the positive responses and maybe, you know, set aside those that were sort of criticisms and ultimately go to market with something that didn't sell? So yeah, yeah. lots of different failure points in there. But ultimately, if you're an innovation leader and, you know, you want to get your senior leadership team to support what you're doing or... You believe the direction may not be right. Well, get that thing out, faithfully communicate with the target customer and work really hard to get that data. Do they support it or not? And yeah. turn around and say, look, don't listen to me. Look at the data. Here's the focus group stuff. Right. Here's exactly the voice of the customer. Yeah. Yeah. Let me give yeah. you that data and then you can make decisions accordingly. Yeah, It's amazing to think back. Somebody, that wheel that you show is really hard, that spinner, very hard to use, so tiny. You, you got to imagine that had they really put that in the hands of of people, they would have noticed that that's not going to be very well adopted. So either they didn't get it out there, or they they said, "Well, you know, that's not representative. I'm not going to believe that." Who knows? We weren't there at the time, right? The competitive pressures and all. But but user experience. The thing that's going through my mind, Alex, is this was 20 years ago, right? And now here we are. 20 years later, different technologies, right, different issues. But think about AI. I mean, it's all over the place, and everybody trying to just jump to a, a solution that has AI without really understanding the value it brings, you know, what business problem it's solving, what's the outcome. Let's just, let's just put some cool AI in our, 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 our software, our machines, our, our robotics, or whatever. Let's just, let's just do it because we can. It's almost like parallels. Here we are 20 years later with the same challenges. Yeah, I mean, look, I think when it comes to AI, generative AI, everybody's concerned about getting left behind. They may have missed yeah. some, you know, previous things, the the internet, you know, the web, whatever it was. Yeah. And they're like, we don't want to get left behind in, you know, in this. So yeah, there's a lot of like, I guess, shoot and then ready and aim, which is, yeah. you know, the wrong order. Right. Yeah. But, but again, it, it is that issue of, are we building the thing that will delight the customer or are we building the thing that will delight us right that's and that conversation is is rarely had the more digitally dna an organization and the more that you're building something that can be flexible and evolve because it's software services yeah. i think the better position you are to evolve with the times and so again this is a challenge increasingly of those more analog organizations that make physical things yeah. The more and more they can be digital and have solutions that can customize with the times, I think the more successful they will be at making the things that delight the customer over time rather than just the things that delight them, their existing capabilities and their existing yeah. organizational yeah, structures. Sure. sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of the, the Apple TV, which because I have one, I've gone through many generations with that. And I'm sure it's similar for Chromecast and others. But if there was a search bar, but then when you wanted to search, you had to move this cursor over, select a letter, move it, select. And it was just a horrible experience. And then, uh, you yeah, they eventually came, one, a lot of ways they tried to solve that, uh, an app on your phone that you could use your phone, which is easier to type on, the keyboard comes up. Uh, and now, you know, a voice, you can just tell, you pick up the remote and you actually talk to it and it does the search for you. So, you know, it, it's interesting that this is, uh, it's just an interesting thing of, 
an annoyance that somebody else could have, but they didn't. And so Apple kept going, 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 and eventually found a way to solve it. But during those years, you're vulnerable if you have such a bad user experience. You are vulnerable to somebody else coming along and just offering something way better. Yeah, very true. Right. So I think it's this idea of now creating platforms on which you can create experiences, again, digital experiences that enables you to move through some of these, you know, generations of experiences to meet the needs of the consumer versus some of these devices. Again, back in those days where, I mean, the amount of effort, the amount of investment, the amount of rigidity is created for over years to make something like this and have it not be a hit. I mean, these are the things that are absolutely destructive to leading companies. For a lot of organizations these days, it's a little bit, you know, different because of how supply chains have been created, just in time, modular. So organizations are able to now move with greater agility than ever before. But some of those challenges, again, are are, are still there. So it's really incumbent on leaders to say, you know something, we got to be built to change. It's not to be built to last is being built to change. What can we create within our organizations and our organizational capabilities that will allow us to adapt as needed because that agility, the ability to adapt, absolutely a premium. If you can do it, you win. And if you can't, I think sort of the end is inevitable, you know, TBD how long, but you know, inflexibility, rigidity, you know, that puts companies under. Well, it's been a fun conversation, Alex. It's just, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And I thought it'd be, you know, bringing back real world experiences Let's not forget what happened then because it's relevant, I think, today. And so that was really fun. Appreciate you sharing some of those those thoughts. Any any final comment that you'd say, oh, we, you know, as we wrap this up, any advice or any you know suggestions for people or Yeah, well, Paul, thank you again for, for having me. I really appreciate it. Look, the last thing I'll say, and, and I say it when I've run workshops in the past, you know, what I try to leave people with is the importance of asking questions asking, you know, tough, basic questions and having honest conversations about those questions and and the answers. This is where large organizations fail. It's because they don't ask very honestly the very tough questions they don't want to hear very openly and honestly the, the answers, and then have the difficult decisions about what you do when the answers suggest you need to do something differently. In the end, if you can't be human and have open, honest conversations about change, I mean, that's where the end begins. And unfortunately, in big companies, it's a big problem. It's It's very important for leadership teams to figure out, can they be honest? Can they have these open conversations, transparent ones about the questions and about change? And can they role model it? If they do, these are the building blocks to actually not only just surviving as a large company, but, but becoming a leader or remaining a leader. And if you can't, Again, you know, there's there's tons of mobile devices in, 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 in the box that I have of organizations no longer around. Yeah, there you go. Well, thanks again, Alex. Really appreciate you, you just sharing a conversation with me. I always enjoy this. So, yeah, have a great rest of your day and good luck preparing for Impact. And we will definitely see you there. And I encourage people to check out in a lead because yeah, you know, these are the conversations that you can find in there and the information you could find. So this is what innovation is about. So thanks again, Alex. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. Hope you all enjoyed that. You know, just keep in touch. Feel free to reach out to, to Alex or myself if you want to engage in any of these conversations. And until next week, I wish you all a great week ahead. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. Thanks for joining us this week for Innovation Talks with Paul Heller. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, or wherever you listen to podcasts. For additional information on today's topic, check out sophion.com, S-O-P-H-E-O-N.com, where you will find plenty of innovation-centric content and corporate best practices. If you'd like to discuss anything with Paul or would like to get in touch with the show, email us at talks at sophion.com.